yes, the theme for this morning, investing in agribusiness, and it's certainly easy to say uh, we're open for business. Um, the question is, is, should we be neutral on the source of that investment, uh, the strings that comes with it or its outcomes? Uh, I strongly think that we should have a view, uh, a view informed by some key questions. Uh, who's the beneficiary? What's the value to be captured? Where is investment most needed? And then if we answer those questions, we can form a view on who and how we should invest. Certainly, um, a, when we're looking for a vision for a investment, what's that great success vision that uh, Andrew has wonderfully outlined this morning? Um, the Green Paper provides some focus for us. It talks about sustainability, competitiveness, product, productive and profitable. But it also talks to us about the beneficiary. It's for the benefit of economy and our society. There is no doubt that there's plenty of interest uh, in food and ag uh, in Asia, investing in those things right across Asia, and uh, particularly in Australia. Uh, our assets are very attractive. But also, as being mentioned, our expertise, our brands, and our proximity to that market. So there's good multiples being paid uh, by those who truly recognize the future potential of our sector. I suppose the question is, do we recognize that potential? Is it as simple as being open for business? Do we care on the source and the intent of that investment? A recent uh, Allen's Ag Business Survey of, of investors makes some interesting insights, and it talks very much about agriculture being slightly different to mining, perhaps. That agriculture would require a more selective, forward-thinking strategy geared around sustainability and directed towards capitalising on Australia's competitive advantage. So if we need to be selective and forward-thinking, what are those criteria? Again, looking at the green paper, there's some useful shopping lists of areas of focus and, as well, the intended beneficiaries. Certainly, farm gate returns, as mentioned this morning uh, by the minister, is one area of focus. Infrastructure, regulation and markets are all that side of improving the economy. But on the other side, there is how do those benefits flow? How do they flow to the family farm, to the creation of jobs in rural Australia? How do they flow to the regional communities? And how do they flow to delivering us as well? High quality and affordable fresh food. As the uh, CEO of a grower cooperative, I will express freely some bias here. Uh, I believe the economy and the society of Australia are uniquely represented by the Australian grower. It's the Australian grower and farm gate returns that should be one really important measure of the success of any investment. So what's the opportunity? Well, I think um, it's said by many, and uh, this is trying to get a lot into one slide of the opportunity before us. We have sustainable growing demand in our backyard, wonderful demand and very close to us. We have consistent but limited export surpluses. And just as the minister said, we're not the food bowl, perhaps we're the food saucer of, of Asia. We can, we can food, at the moment, and when Andrew gets going, we maybe can feed more people. At the moment, we could feed about 60 million people. So the question is, is which 60 million do we feed? And we have a strong reputation for reliability, quality, and importantly, low sovereign risk. It's these three things together, added together, or perhaps multiplied by each other, that leads to the true value that's to be captured from investing in agribusiness. So the value is more than the economic value of some of the assets that might be up for sale, or even not up for sale, but sought by others. I believe we've got to capture the maximum possible long-term value from our unique supply chain, our proximity of demand, and our reputation. So there's no doubt there's plenty of areas requiring investment of capital across our ag business. 
and investment of in, in innovation to capture that value on offer. We know that input costs in Australia relative to other origins are high. We have a very efficient farm unit, production unit called the family farm. It's been tested over decades, centuries, uh, with other models, but it turns out to be very, very efficient, giving the room to grow. But the, our family farmers are an ageing population and facing quite significant succession issues. Infrastructure is crucial to connecting us to the world and to those markets. And in some areas, particularly in rail, this is failing, and it is failing our grain sector. There is investor interest in these assets right across the, along the supply chain. The concern that I'll raise is what's the impact of that investment on those supply chains and their efficiencies? And finally, there's a lot we can do around regulation, both adding and removing, but also ensuring that wherever it is, that it's fostering responsible investment. So as mentioned, the variable costs of production in Australia are high compared to, compared to other origins. This is just, in some respects, a state of where we are, the conditions of our soils and so on. But there is much that we can do. At the same time, subsidies in Australia are very low. And I am not advocating additions of subsidies. But we need to recognise what we're up against. And it is a role, I believe, of government, as is intended, to incentivise and support appropriate investment and ensure that our agriculture is competitive. If I refer back again to the, uh, the Allen survey of international investors, which asked the question, what hurts Australia's reputation as an, as an attractive place to invest in agriculture? The top one was our variable climate. The next one was wage and input costs. The next three were all related, in some respects, to government decision making. When it comes to infrastructure, and particularly the export supply chain, we have some real, real challenges. Now, this is not exactly an apples for apples comparison, but it's good enough. This is one of our major competitors, Canada, where they would take about five and a half trains to load a 60,000 tonne vessel of wheat, and we would take up to 16 trains to do the same job. Restrictions on train lengths, axle weights, speed, and even just access to the line when temperatures are above a certain uh, level in harvest time, as we have in Australia, add huge inefficiencies to our supply chain. And I really concur with Andrew's comments about we are standing at a critical moment in our competitiveness. Our proximity to the demand has given us, made us maybe a little lazy, a little self-assured that Asia will buy their food from us in preferable to more distant origins. We are now seeing huge competition coming from the Black Sea, from Ukraine and Russia, from Europe, from Canada, North America, and now from South America. We are seeing our Argentinian competitors loading uh, cape-sized vessels with grain to be able to compete on a supply chain cost into the Middle East and displace Australian grain. The cost of the inefficiencies on our supply chain are born out of the price of grain offered at the farm gate. Other issues requiring investment of time and money are listed here around market access. I learned a lot in my involvement recently in B20 and the G20 process around the protectionism that um, existed around agricultural produce, but also how that protectionism was resisted and reduced following the GFC. The G20 nations got together and worked very hard to reduce the level of protectionism and trade barriers. What unfortunately happened in exchange for that was the creation of 1,500 new murky trade barriers that grew up post the GFC. Lots of talk about market power, and do growers have market power? And this is often phrased in the way that growers might relate one way or another, or through supply chains to supermarkets in Australia. But I think this is too much of a myopic and domestic view here. The issue for market power for me is around growers' participation and ownership in supply chains. There's a lot of talk around the emergence of dedicated supply chains. I'd like to go one level below that phrase, or euphemism, and understand what is it about and who is the beneficiary here. If it is an issue, what is the role of growers in their supply chain and in the way that they can access capital? And then what's the way that we need to continue to invest long term in innovation and R&D? 
So those are the issues. What are some of the solutions requiring investment and who should be the investor? Certainly, what can we do to reduce these input costs? The cost of inputs and labour and producing a crop. What can we do to provide the growers some form of better produced safety net here? And I'm talking around multi peril crop insurance. What is that risk of loss, minimised risk of loss that we could provide our growers so they would have the confidence to continue to grow during those uncertain seasons where they pull back on the fertiliser, they pull back on the husbandry because of the nerves of the further loss, when in fact that may have come good? What can we do when it comes to investing in the supply chain, in rail? and in supply chains that work for growers? And what can we do around regulation that might assist in that? When it comes to market access, one of the key recommendations from the B20 Trade Task Force was to ratify the WTO barley package. And multilateral agreements are important. They get harder and harder to achieve as more and more countries are involved in them. And we do revert to free trade agreements. They are also crucial to us and the Minister mentioned those three really important recent ones just now, this morning. When it comes to market power, as I've talked about, is how do we allow our, our organisations, our growers, to achieve scale in the region? We are competing as an organisation and as, as a country against some major global powers and global multinational firms. All could be good for our, for our nation as well, but how do we grow our own ones? How do our growers have long-term supply agreements with our distant markets? How do they participate in that? And how do they have some control? When it comes to innovation, I understand there's a levy review at the moment, which I think is asking the right questions. What are the benefits and who's the ben is the beneficiary very, very clear, as I'm asking this morning? As we explore more the role of investment in the interest of the grower, Maybe we can talk about a little bit of a phrase of responsible investment. A recent Rabobank study on competitive challenges of Australian agriculture identified a double-edged sword. Now, this is talking about the sugar industry, and I have no connection to it, and maybe straying into areas here that I might not, should not. But there's a lot of benefits here in what's happened in the sugar industry, I understand, from the injection of capital from foreign investors. And it says here it's reignited growth in the industry. But there is a but. Farmers themselves have lost control of a key part of the value chain. The question is, is this an issue or not? A G20 food security and nutrition framework report spoke about responsible investment and hinted at the importance of grower organisations, cooperatives and small and medium enterprises in investing as they're the ones that often increase incomes and quality of employment, the ones that increase local productivity and sustainability of the supply chains. These are similar aims to the Green Paper and also my assertion of, of good for the Australian economy and society. Talking of, I'm sorry, talking of cooperatives, just as an example, here is CBH, a West Australian uh, grower cooperative, 4,500 growers across the state growing 10 to 15 million tonnes. They own the 195 warehouses across the state. They own the 20 million tonnes of storage that they deliver to. They own a recent $175 million investment in new locomotives and wagons to bring the grain to port. They own the four ports. They own a marketing and trading business that competitively acquires about half their grain and markets it on their behalf direct to customers around the world to over 30 countries. They control and ship about 70% of that grain themselves. And they now own seven flour mills in Southeast Asia and Malaysia, two, two mills in Indonesia, one in Vietnam, including a port, and four in Malaysia. And this is Australia investing itself downstream into the market so our growers can capture margins as they get closer to the market and bring those margins back to reinvest in the supply chain here in Australia. So this is an example on the left of a grower open supply chain where growers will deliver to a warehouse where there will be 10 prices for their grain, where acquirers of grain are acquiring through an open supply chain and actively competing at the most distant delivery point from the port. Dedicated supply chains owned by individual investors may bring additional competition. That could be good. 
but that would only happen if they are running side by side. And quite often a grower arriving at a dedicated supply chain will find only one price on offer. So the question is that does the open supply chain owned by the growers, which has economies of scale, freight savings, consolidation of stocks, it allows our growers to blend their lots online and present blended lots to the, to the world, achieving an arbitrage advantage for themselves, and it offers free warehousing. What are the pros and cons of that against dedicated supply chains? Do dedicated supply chains really deliver additional farm gate returns? If we're unsure, we should proceed with caution. If they do, it's something that we continue to embrace and ensure that they do work in the interests of the Australian grower. I openly acknowledge it's difficult for growers to act together and raise capital. But if they don't, the chain may not be their friend. If they do, they should be encouraged and supported and not constrained by domestic competition policy settings. Having spent my career in uh, ag and food and started in ag research, I admit another bias uh, this morning um, and a concern at the lack of R&D in long lead time work. The lag time between research and outcome, I believe, does need strong government direction and support. There is a very good established relationship between total factor productivity and R&D, but we seem to be seeing, from the data I look at, reduced R&D intensity, perhaps in exchange for a more immediate, perhaps more sexy, market-focused approach. There is still plenty to be done, plenty of research to be done in crop yields, soil health, water efficiency, and new crops, particularly suited to Australia, and the changing diet of our markets close by in Asia. And there's plenty to be done by both private and the public sector. Fully acknowledge that. In closing, I want to return to the theme of welcoming investment in agriculture from all sources, as long as the test is the national interest of our economy and society. The opportunity of welcome foreign investment is much, much more the injectum of capital that is otherwise hard to find. The opportunity is for us to invest along the supply chain and down the supply chain and into our markets to maximise the value of our limited but highly sought after export surplus. So in summary, Australia offers security supply, proximity, product integrity, low sovereign risk, food safety, innovation, and brands. That's a lot on offer. And Asia offers us, in return, some security of demand, a growing middle class consuming higher margin products, although others are chasing that market as well. We have to ensure that investment by domestic or overseas businesses delivers the maximum possible value to the Australian economy and society over the long term. And I suggest that farm gate returns is a good test of that benefit to economy and society. So I implore that in welcoming investment in agriculture, we do see and seek the long-term value and not sell ourselves short. Thank you.